How would you like to have a watch that not only tells the time, has a torch and laser pointer, but can also work as the control for a home automation system? Well in this video I'll show you how to make one. The whole project is based around an ESP32 TTGO development board, which you can get for around £10. We'll be using this board as it is based on the ESP32 microcontroller, giving it both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. Also, the board has an LTH78 BMS IC, which stands for Battery Management System, that, well, uh, manages the battery. No, but basically it protects the battery from short circuit, overcharge, which is when the battery is charged to high voltage, and over discharge, which is when the battery is discharged to lower voltage, which all can decrease the lifespan of it. Another advantage of using an ESP32 based development board are the vastly superior specs compared to, say, a generic Arduino Nano, which in this case allows the screen to be driven very quickly. Finally, and the main reason we'll be using it is because of the nice sharp 240 by 135 display, which weirdly costs more to buy without the rest of the board. What? So you're saying, I could go buy TT Go boards, they sold to their screen, sell them, make a profit, and then have the rest of a perfectly good ESP32 development board? Yes. Hmm. Huh. Oh yeah, this is supposed to be a tutorial. Firstly, we'll get the case sorted. Thankfully, I've already designed it, which definitely took more than a couple of revisions. So you can go ahead and print that out on your 3D printer. You can find the SDLs in the description. I would of course recommend using an FDM printer rather than an SLA, as even cured resin may be toxic. Another thing that I would definitely recommend is first putting down a layer of glue stick, as the edges are quite rounded, which makes the print more prone to peeling off the bed. I'll be printing with Filamentum Vertigo Starlight PLA, and as always I'll be printing it on my Artillery Sidewinder X1. Once the case is done, you'll probably want to clean up the glue with rubbing alcohol. After that, we can then remove the corner pads with clippers. Now for the wrist straps. For this, we'll use NinjaFlex Flexible TPU, which may not be the cheapest, but can come out with very good prints. The thing with flexible TPUs is that they need very specific settings to work well. The two most important conditions are temperature and speed. If you have too high a temperature, the walls will be wavy as the filament doesn't come out consistently. If you have too low a temperature, the printer will under extrude and the filament again will not come out consistently. If you print too quickly, the printer will also under extrude and, you guessed it, the filament will not come out consistently. I found the best for my printer was to raise it to a temperature of 225 degrees and to print at 40 millimeters per second. Hopefully, you'll get that working fairly quickly because I didn't. To connect the straps, I was inspired by other watches where they slot tiny pins in holes on the case and straps. For this, I decided to use a 2mm brass tubing, as you should be able to get it easily at a DIY shop. If the tube doesn't fit perfectly into the case, you can just heat it up with a lighter or heat gun. To cut the tube, I'm going to use a knife, as wire cutters would bend the ends and make it impossible to fit in the case. Oh yeah, don't forget to print this thingy. We'll glue it to the straps with Gorilla Glue. Okay, that's the case done. We'll put in the electronics now. All the parts I'm going to use are linked in the description below, which includes a TTGO ESP32 T-Display development board, a 6mm 650nm laser diode, a 5mm white LED, a 220mAh battery, a 2N222NPN transistor, two 6x6x6 six by six by six tactile switches, an SS12F15 sliding switch, a DS3231 RTC module, a 1 kilo ohm resistor, and 30 gauge silicon wire, but you could also use enameled copper wire. Here's the schematic that I made that we'll be using, as well as one for the position of the components. Before you solder them in, there is actually a BMS on the battery that you want to remove, as there is of course one already on the board. To remove the BMS, you need to make sure that you clip the wires one at a time, because clipping them together will short the battery and damage it. Also, you'll need to remove the tabs on the side of the sliding switch, and solder off the sockets of the RTC to save space. When you got your TT Go board, you should have also received these pins and this connector. You don't need the pins for this project, but you will need the connector. It's used to connect the battery to the port on the bottom of the board. Okay, now I'll go ahead and solder the parts together. 
Make sure you solder the wires to the bottom of the board, as it will need to sit flush with the case. If any of the components don't fit in the holes, you can just make them bigger with a file. And make sure you leave the laser diode protruding so you can focus the laser beam properly. That's the hardware portion of this video done. Now for the software. But before we get into that, it would be really helpful if you were to leave a like and maybe consider subscribing. Thanks. First of all, you want to make sure that the USB-C cable is a data cable and not just a charging cable. You can do this by plugging it into a phone and seeing if it allows files to be transferred. The first download you want to do is the Arduino IDE. It's really easy, so I won't cover it right now. Once that's installed, we need to tell the IDE what board we'll be dealing with. We can do this by opening file, then going down to preferences. This will then come up. Next, you want to paste in this URL, where it says additional board manager URLs, then press OK. Next, we'll go to tools. Uh, don't worry if it doesn't look exactly like this yet. Uh, go to boards, then board manager, and type in ESP32, then click install. Mine is already installed. That will have downloaded firmware for many different ESP32 development boards, but we need to select the one that we'll be using. To do this, go to Tools, Boards, ESP32, Arduino, then click on one called TTGO LoRa32 OLED V1. Next, you'll need to install drivers to work with the board, uh, except for if you're using Linux. In that case, you don't need to do this. Um, link is of course in the description. All you need to do is click on the top one if you're using Windows or the second one if you're using Mac. Open up the zip file and then open the Windows 64 executable file. It'll be something similar for Mac, I'm sure. By the way, you don't need WinRAR for this, but I just have it because it's pretty useful. Now plug in the board. When you plugged in the board, you should see this demo sketch carry out. That just indicates that it's factory new. Next, we need to select the port via tools, then port. For me, it's port 7, but it probably won't be for you. To check, you can just unplug the board and see which port disappears. To check it is working, we can go to examples, then scroll down to ESP32, then chip ID, and click on get chip ID. Once that open, make sure you have the right port selected. If so, press the arrow, that will compile the code, then upload it onto the board. It will also remove the demo sketch, so, you know, Say goodbye to that. It should take about 10 to 30 seconds to upload. Uh, you can see when it's done from the progress bar disappearing. Now go to tools, then open serial monitor, and then click on baud rate and select 115,200. And you should see it print this. That means that everything you've done so far is right. So good job. We'll now download one of the libraries we'll be using. To do this, go to tools, then click on manage libraries. It might take a minute to load, but once it has, type in tft underscore ESPI and then install this one. Make sure it's the one that says by Bodmer. Now you'll need to find the TFT ESP library on your computer. For me, it's under documents, Arduino, library. Now open up this folder, then open up this file, user setup select .h. That should open in something similar to this. What we want to do here is comment out this line, line 22, by typing in two forward slashes, then scroll down to line 53 where it says setup 25, uncomment that by deleting those two forward slashes. Then go to file, then click save, and now you can close this window. All that will have enabled the board to use its display. To see if it's working, you can open the Arduino IDE, go to file, examples, then scroll down to TFT underscore ESPI. You probably won't have all these libraries, so don't worry. Uh, they're not anything to do with this project. They're just uh, stuff I've downloaded to work with loads of different things. Anyway, uh, go to TFT underscore ESPI, then generic, then select this alpha blend sketch. That should open up in a new window. Go ahead and upload that by pressing the arrow. Once that's uploaded, you should see your TTGO board display this. That means that everything so far is working. Now we'll install a plugin that allows images to be uploaded to the board, also linked in the description. First, click on the top one, which should download a zip file. Uh, we'll want to unzip it. I'm just gonna do it manually by putting it onto my desktop and dragging it out of this file. Next, go to documents, Arduino, 
then create a folder named tools. Then we'll want to put our unzipped folder into it. If you have the IDE open, you'll need to close it to get it working. Once you open it again, you can go to tools and this should have appeared. ESP32 sketch data upload. Next, we're going to download a few more libraries. Once again, we go to tools, then manage libraries. First, we're going to download JPEG decoder, which allows JPEG images to be displayed. Next, RTC lib by Adafruit, which allows the board to communicate with the RTC module. And finally, button two, which handles buttons. Finally, we'll get the sketch for the watch that I wrote on my GitHub page. Again, link in the description. Go ahead and download that. Take the zip folder and put it on your desktop. Open up the zip file and get the folder named watch3 and then drag that into your uh, Arduino folder. Then open up the watch3 folder and open this sketch, also called watch3. So once that's open, you can go to tools and then click on ESP32 sketch data upload. And in the meantime, we can go down to line 102. We want to get rid of these two forward slashes to uncomment this line. Um, what this does is it tells the RTC module what the date is. Once the images are done, you can upload it. Once that's uploaded, you want to upload it again, but with this line commented out. Otherwise, it will keep resetting the time every time it turns on and off. If you look now at your watch, you'll see that it's telling the time, which means it's done. Finally, I'll show you how to use it properly. To navigate to different functions, you double click these buttons. The first screen has time, obviously, but it also has temperature, which matches environmental temperature when you're not wearing it. If you double click on the right button, it should take you to the stopwatch screen, where you can start the stopwatch by clicking the right button once and stop it by clicking the left button once. It will automatically reset when you press the right button again. If we double click the right button again, we will get the peripheral screen, where we can turn on the LED by pressing the right button for half a second, or turn on the laser by doing the same with the left button. For the battery, it lasts for about 4 hours of screen time, so I put a function that turns the backlight off after 30 seconds, but only if you're on the time screen. If you don't like that, you can go to the sketch and comment out line 607, then re-upload the code. I would recommend turning it off every time you're not using it, as then the battery can last weeks on a single charge. To charge it, plug in a USB Type-C cable, and it should take about half an hour. When it's connected to the charger, you'll see that it says connected in the bottom left. This doesn't necessarily mean that it is charging. When it is charging, you'll see a dim blue light come out of the LED. So when that light turns off, you know that it is fully charged. And finally, unplugging it will show a battery monitor in the corner. That's about all I have to say for this video. I was originally going to talk about the whole home automation system, um, and also a different design for a watch that actually became between the first watch and this watch, hence why the sketch is called Watch 3. But I've spent about as much time as I want in this video, plus some, so tell me in the comments if you want to see that. Or don't. But I have an exam in two days. Less than two days.